Three Arrow Capital was a hedge fund that exclusively focused on crypto projects. It was founded by Carl Davies and Su Zhu in 2012. They were managing somewhere between 10 and 18 billion in total asset value. But a lot of their capital was actually sourced from lenders with little to no collateral. So what happened? To understand why this crypto hedge fund went down, you have to understand the context. Number one, the algorithmic stablecoin Terra USD and reserve Luna went to zero, wiping out almost 45 billion in total value. Three Arrow Capital had a 200 million stake in Luna. Cryptocurrency lender Celsius Network filed for bankruptcy. Crypto broker Voyager filed for bankruptcy since they had loaned 665 million to Three Arrow Capital. Three Arrow Capital owes 27 creditors a total of 3.5 billion. There were a few other things, for example, allegedly the founders funneled out money to use on their personal expenses. And now after they file for bankruptcy, they're actually in hiding because of death threats. So why did this happen? I think this is an amazing story about risk mitigation and why you shouldn't take big bets exclusively. For example, they thought it was near impossible for the stablecoin to actually go to zero in a matter of days. And they were so confident in Bitcoin that they were the largest holders of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust by investing 1 billion. But when the Bitcoin price dropped, they actually were at a major loss. Of the two co-founders, I'm gonna focus on the interview of Davis because of the two, his interviews are the most telling. His co-founder was kind of measured but he went all in. So let's get into the interview. There was a bunch of chat about the super cycle and I, um, and I asked him, you know, what if it's not, what if uh, this is just another, um, you know, four year boom bust, um, like classic um, Bitcoin cycle. What does that, what does that mean? Um, how are your views for, for that today? Is it the like, Amazon chart fractal still on the cards. This is Davies, this is one of the co-founders of Three Arrow Capital. And the interviewer is asking about the super cycle because the idea is that there's a long period of sustained growth. You see the price of Bitcoin, it goes up and then it goes down. So there's always these big crashes and then it repeats, right? It goes up, then it crashes, repeat. But the idea of the super cycle is that there's a long period of sustained growth. So you're not gonna have the same crashes that you have with this boom bust cycle. So let's see how he answers. Getting that um, you know, traditionally there hasn't been a drawdown this large where the bull markets continued um, afterwards. So um, how are you feeling on, on, on that these days? Uh, I mean, we're still, uh, like our, our thesis about, you know, like, like, a, like a boom bust cycle in 2017 anyways, uh, was much more at, at that time or, or like our thinking of that time is much more around uh, like forced selling. Um, so, you know, when a bunch of ICO treasuries raise in ETH and have to sell ETH and are, are like in order to pay salaries and then other people start selling and then it just becomes cascading all the way down. Right. And that's how things can go down 95%. Right. But in a, uh, yeah, like in the current environment, I, I really just don't see that. Um, I see like this pullback was harsh, uh, like a, not uh, at least a standard devi deviation, if not two away from what I thought was possible basically at, at that time. He's doing this since 2012, right? So now obviously it went spectacularly wrong, like really, really bad, but still he was operating for quite a while. So I'm not gonna say that he knows nothing, right? But what he's just saying about him having a very, this harsh correction, whatever in 2017, right? He said this was kind of in the error margins of what he expected. It was off from what he expected, what was kind of wrong, right? This kind of should make you think, right? Because if it was already something that surprised you at some point, you should have a higher level of risk mitigation. Because let's say you go into an environment that you think is safe, but suddenly you have an arrow landing right next to your head, right? And you think, oh, this was a little bit too close for my comfort. It, so I'm going to make sure that I risk mitigate and I make sure this can't happen again, right? It was too close. So in his case, you would expect that if there was a correction that really hurt him and he says this was out of my thinking, right? So I didn't expect this. His risk mitigation should be ramped up. Uh, like trying to shutting down Bitcoin mining and, uh, and the market has corrected. Like the point of, I think the point that we were trying to convey is with a super cycle, it's not like there, there's still volatility, right? It, I mean, it, especially for Bitcoin, it's a fixed supply asset. Like there's going to be volatility, right? Because supply uh, or because supply is fixed and demand is not. 
but I don't think I fully get that. Supply is fixed, demand isn't fixed, and thus you have a volatile asset. I would expect that if you have an unfixed supply, unfixed demand, meaning both can fluctuate, supply can fluctuate, demand can fluctuate, then you have the most volatile asset, right? Because it entirely depends on two different stakeholders. So you have a two variable system. If one is fixed and the other one isn't, then I would expect it to be less volatile. And if both are fixed, I would expect it to not be volatile at all, the demand supply. So I don't know why they're all nodding. But you can see the founder of three arrow capital is very much convinced that this is a super cycle there's going to be the same growth we're not going to see this major major crash obviously spoiler alert is what happened right uh but that doesn't mean that we go into a four-year bear like i think that's the point it doesn't mean we go into a four-year bear it just means that we correct and okay now, now we've corrected now now let's keep going right um there's no, there's no more forced selling beyond this, basically, is the, is the thinking. So his thinking was there's going to be a mild correction that isn't going to be a full crash, and it's just going to keep going, keep going, keep going. He sounds too optimistic, and it doesn't sound convincing at all why the bad stuff wouldn't happen. Why wouldn't there be a four-year bear market? Why wouldn't it really crash? Why wouldn't all of this happen? His explanations are a little, little vague. So just seeing that, I'm actually not too surprised that this happened. You've said several times on Twitter that you've had two good years of trading. I suspect this might be your third uh in 2021 can you talk about betting big when you have conviction and how those two years really impacted your investing life um so uh both of them were business decisions really and everything flowed therefrom. so i think the biggest decision we made for crypto anyways was to close all other desks um so that this is such a funny postmortem. Don't forget, they blew all of their money. They had a lot of debt and all that and hiding because of death threats because everything broke down. All of their assumptions, or let's say their big assumptions were wrong. So this didn't work out. Now he's talking about one year ago, how these were the great decisions, right? So for example, closing all the other deaths, which means they only focus on crypto. So this is the opposite of diversification, right? They were kind of diversifying because they were holding cryptocurrencies. They were directly equity investing in crypto focused companies. So they were diversifying when it comes to the different instruments, but everything was bound to crypto and they took really, really big bets at a few things that were just inherently very high risks, right? So it wasn't conservative at all. And it also wasn't diversified at all. Everyone at the firm was focused only on crypto and uh, to denominate in Bitcoin. Um, that is to outperform Bitcoin. Uh, those two decisions everything therefrom followed, right? Because that meant that, uh, you know, if the market went up, I we were valuing either pre-sales or uh, other investments or other coins or Ethereum or whatever it may be against Bitcoin. Um, and that just meant we grew with the market. Um, and uh, as we would earn like our level returns, they were very good, right? Like, especially during DeFi summer and uh, during periods of high volatility, there were, uh, you know, 50 plus percent annualized returns on basis trades. Uh, but yeah, like it wasn't 50% the whole year. Maybe it was 30% on average or something like that. It was a very good year. But if you're denominating Bitcoin, like the, the well, that, now it's an amazing year. Like um, if you're denominating dollars, that was like, okay, you beat a bunch of hedge funds. So um, I think that was our greater, uh, uh, the best decision we made. Or not, you know? I mean, it was the best decision they made in the short term, but it wasn't the best decision in the long term. Because this whole industry is so young, but also so volatile, all of the strategies are kind of short term. And there isn't much data going back. If you look at the stock market, you can look back a long time. If you look at crypto, you can't look back that far. But just focusing on crypto, in my opinion, wasn't the worst thing they did. The worst thing they did was the amount of risk they were comfortable with. Because there are a lot of companies in the crypto space that you can invest in and they have certain value propositions that's fine and there's also bitcoin is still around it hasn't disappeared just the bets you made around that destroyed you so it's not so much about crypto it's more about the bets that were comfortable taking um, it also meant that we could swing the biggest risk um, if the founders of the firm believe in this they can hold the whole balance sheet as such uh, if they have a group then that just doesn't happen um yeah, like we, we see a bunch of uh, large traditional, like if you were to name the five biggest hedge funds in the US, I think two of them have opened big crypto desks in the past couple of months. Um, 
Okay, what he's saying is that because they're the small founder team, they can make all the decision. And if they make crazy choices, they do them. If they make conservative choices, they do them. But there's no one who's saying, hey, you can't do that. There's no team effort. There's no risk mitigation department, right? They just hold the strategy against the light. Look, looks all right. And then they go with it. He's now kind of saying that we are better positioned because we don't have these teams in place. But you can now clearly say this is where you had the downfall, right? Because they didn't have the overseers. They didn't have a big team. They didn't have a risk department. They didn't have people who were saying, hey, wait a second, risk is too big. You're not diversifying enough. Like no one could come in there. Right? They would just go, go, go. But the founders aren't doing it right like it's this is a group this is a separate so these groups will do well but they're not they're they're definitely not going to outperform like a founder driven group that is like bitcoin denominant like he, he's basically exactly saying that they will do well because this is the conservative approach this will do well in the long term this is the type of business you want to have if you go for a long time you want to make sure that the company doesn't go bankrupt but he's not saying hey you're not going to outperform bitcoin all of that yeah but we're going to survive one approach is definitely higher performance, but the other approach is probably going to live longer. He's now proud of outperforming Bitcoin for a while, and he's kind of disparaging, let's say, conversional hedge funds, where he is the one who's now hiding somewhere in Singapore because they're getting death threats. Like, that's just not going to happen, right? So um, I think, yeah, I think if people want to do well, they just have, they basically just have to go all in, like th dead themselves, not, not like hire people, not like give money to someone else, like, like New Year's advice for hedge funds. I'm not an expert, but don't go all in. Definitely don't go all in. Make sure the risk is always mitigated, that you have a risk strategy in place, because otherwise you're just gambling. And if you gamble with leverage, which means you borrow money from people in order to gamble, this is the most ridiculous. The first layer of ridiculousness is just to gamble away your money, right? This is a dumb thing to do. An even dumber thing to do is to borrow money from others and then to gamble it away, because now you're in debt, Plus, you don't have any money. Yeah, don't go all in. Like you yourself say like, hey, like close all of the desks, do only this, uh, you know, and when I see the opportunity, like I, like I have no problem doing it, like going all in, right? Well, I, I think a lot of it is, uh, age, it's about agency as well. Um, there's like this easy temptation to want other people to do the work, right? And to, uh, you know, try to offload the risk in some way, right? Um, I bet now he wishes he had offloaded the risk in some way. Reality, like actually all the, it's your capital, right? It's your risk. You get the, upside, like, and thus you should take the agency over it. And when you take that agency, then that's where you can make the convic conviction bets. It's no longer, you know, a 1% bet. If this goes like, I, I hate the lot. There's a couple of, uh, Actually, there's a lot of <laughs> trading logic, which I did. Okay, he's, he's got to go to that. Tell everybody listening, conviction and agency doesn't do anything for you if you're going to be the one who is hiding because they're getting death threats because you messed up. It's much better to be conservative, to be very aware of the risk, make sure you mitigate the risk as much as possible, and you're not leaning yourself too far out the window. Because if you lean too far, you're going to fall out. And obviously this is what he did. Can't stand, which is just super illogical because the human condition in general is a very Ill, like ill-suited for trading. Uh, you have to, you know, counter a lot of uh, natural tendencies. Um, but, but one of them is to say things like, um, I'm just going to put 1% in and if it does well, great. If it doesn't, then I don't care. Like, well, now you just took away your whole conviction. Like... <laughs> Like, uh, uh, what do you mean you don't care? Like, uh, d d why not make it a bigger, you know, the higher, like, why can't you put in a 5%? Why can't you put in 10 or, or put in 1%? I think what he means by conviction is to be confident in the end result, meaning that I know what is going to happen. Thus, I can be more confident in what I'm doing. Because he just said, if you have 1%, this isn't enough. You take away your conviction, meaning you seem like you don't have the confidence to put in more. But here's the problem. If you're wrong, then you're in trouble. And obviously, in this case they should have known because there was a crash before that there was a huge crash in 2017 it's not like this is a black swan no one saw the coming no it just happened so they should have realized that something like this or something worse than this could happen anytime but they didn't really see it so there's a reason why you have this barbell strategy where you say okay most of my portfolio is going to be in a low or to medium risk environment where i say okay i can put my money in that and I 
know that this is not going to go to zero. This is low to medium risk. These are things that are not very volatile, right? And then a small percentage of what you have, you can put into very high risk things that if you lose everything, it's fine. It was a small percentage of what you own, right? And if it goes up, it's nice because then you got a little windfall, you got a little extra. So that's what he's saying, but he's kind of making fun of that. But there's a reason why you do it because in the long term, if you risk your life every day, you're not going to live very long. This is the point. You can't beat statistics. If you risk everything every day, at some point, you're going to lose it and then it's gone. But with like, know that that will be life changing money so that when it is 10% of your portfolio, you hold it up the other, you know, the next 10x, the next like, um, yeah, the, the, for me, it's all about uh, the human condition, actually thinking about the human condition and is this logical or is this not logical? And there are so many things on crypto Twitter or like, frankly, in your own life that are just like absolute BS when it comes to this. Um, I don't know. I could, I, I could just make a whole, a whole list of them, to be honest, but uh, there, there's just so, so much stuff. Uh, and the only way to understand truth is to just think it logically yourself. Like that, that's really the only way. This is kind of crazy if you think about it. In charge of whatever it was, $18 billion, right? Borrowing a lot, being in debt, bankrupting the lenders because you couldn't give them the money back. They were just saying, okay, we are 100%. Bitcoin is going up. This is a super cycle. This is not going to be a boom bust. We're going to borrow as much as we can. We're going to put it into that, whatever. The Bitcoin trust, Luna, whatever they could find, right? They put a lot of money into that. It only took one domino. It only took one domino to fall, which was Terra Luna, the algorithmic stablecoin. And then it all cascaded down, all the bankruptcies. And now they're hiding because they're getting death threats. So what have we learned? If you want to do it your way, still think about why people are doing it a certain way and why they have been doing it for a long time. And risk is a funny thing because a little bit of risk today isn't that bad. A little bit of risk tomorrow isn't that bad. But a certain amount of risk every single day for the next few years, this can kill you. So they have apparently appeared in the court of Singapore, which is where the fund was registered. But let's see what's going to come out. Is it going to be incompetence or is it going to be fraud? Because if they actually funneled out money, Money. And if they intentionally defrauded the creditors or the investors, then obviously they might end up in prison, right? Thanks for watching.